You are listening to Starter Girls Podcast with Jennifer Loading. Whether you are starting a project, starting a business, starting a brand, or starting a movement, we are here to talk about it. And I am super excited to introduce Mr. Charles Reed here. He's got an impressive accolades. I'm so excited and I'm just excited to get to hear him and share his knowledge with you guys. And so let me tell you a little bit about him. Charles Reed is an MBA, CPA, USTCP, and the founder and CEO of Get Payroll in Louisville, Texas. Mr. Reed's companies have provided full service payroll services, payroll tax services, and other payroll related services since 1991. They help both small and medium sized businesses around the company, or excuse me, around the country with payroll checks and reports, direct deposits, debit cards, and many other things. He's also, what's really neat about him is he can serve as an IRS authorized power of attorney and advocate for his clients. And then he also has, in addition to that, is a United States tax court practitioner, and he has a bar card for the tax court so he can represent his (laughs) clients. That's pretty important and impressive. He's an accomplished senior executive and entrepreneur with more than 50 years of financial leadership experience in a broad range of industries, including manufacturing, both low and high tech, import, retail, and computer software, and more. We love it. He's an author of three books, Starting a New Business, Accounting, Finance, Payroll, and Tax Considerations, Small Business Short Course Employee Book, number one, I love this, and The Little Black Book of the Beauty Biz, volume one. And then you've got a fourth book coming out in July of this year. Am I correct? Yes. Wiley's publishing it uh, July 27th, they say. It'll be ready for shipping. Awesome. Awesome. He's an accomplished speaker, has been featured on Fox Business News, Biz TV Texas, New York City Wire, Dallas and and many more. And in, in addition to his executive career, Mr. Reed is a decorated United States Marine Corps Sergeant and a decorated combat veteran of the Vietnam War. You have some impressive accolades, sir. <laughs> I love it. I survive. I love it. I, I love that. Well, and no, and no doubt. Absolutely, right? You've got to be a survivor these days. But I love yeah. this. So what I want to do with you really quick, we always like to do this kind of for fun. I like to start off with a little rapid fire questions. And you saw these. I sent them to you. So you kind of know ahead a little bit some of this. So real quick, are you a morning or a night person? You know, I used to be a morning person, but in the last uh, few years, I'm much more of an evening night person. I sleep until I get up. Hey, so, that's good. So if I work until, you know, midnight, I may not show up at the office till 10 o'clock. Hey, you have the luxury to do that. I love it. You've I earned do. the rights to do that. Yes. Right? And I'm with you. You know, it's funny <clears> because <throat> this week, interestingly enough, because we've had all this stuff going on that I'm I'm t- typically a morning person. I get up early, I work out and get my day going. But this week, I have been so like a night person. I'm like, what is up with that? It's been years since I've been a night person. I don't even know what to do with that whole thing. My son and I have been watching movies till like two in the morning. I'm like, no, No. we got to stop that. We got too much to do. All right. So next question, are you a cat or a dog person? Personally, I'm a dog person. That's how I grew up. Uh, My eldest daughter was a cat person. So, you know, (laughs) we put up with that. You put up with that. Well, and I have all of them. So we've been, we've got rabbits in gecko and we've had snakes. We've had everything. Oh, Rabbits are great because you can eat them. Well, we don't do that, but <laughs> you know, they do serve rabbit. You're right. They do. I don't know if my house that would go over too well, but you know, Easter's coming up yep. anyway. So, all right. What's your favorite food? My favorite food, and I've heard your question, is probably the Wagyu steak down at Three Forks. Yeah. Chris Vogley, the proprietor there, does up a beautiful dinner. Yeah. Three Forks is good. I have been there, I want to say maybe once. I think I've been there. It hasn't been many times, but I, it's incredible. I've known Chris since he was in high school. Wow. And now his eldest, I think, is out of MIT. So oh, wow. we go way back. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. All right. So I told our listeners a little bit about you, but I want you to expand a little bit. Tell us a little bit about you, married kids, all that good stuff. I know you kind of mentioned a little bit, but fill us in on some stuff. Well, I left high school a year early, uh, joined the Marine Corps at 17, uh, served overseas, Vietnam, was trained as a computer program and systems engineer, uh, and spent time in combat on top of that. Um when I was still married, I was when I was still in service, I moved back to Kansas City, met and married my wife. My wife is my wife was ten years older than I was. She had five kids when I married her. Uh, I claim insanity. Uh, found that I needed a degree to uh, really go with my experience to get a head in business. Uh, went to North Texas, got my uh, BBA, my MBA, sat for and passed my CPA exam at the same time. Started a manufacturing firm at the same time. Uh, And I've worked now for a number of years. I started with Texas Instruments. 
uh, moved to smaller companies over the years, and here 30 years ago, hung out my own shingle because wow. I realized that I was never going to run a major corporation because I didn't have the political skills. Sure, I was unwilling to step on people and stab them in the back and all those political things. So I just started my own company. I love that. I, yeah. I, wow. I love that. Well, and you know, and yeah, just the part where you said, I'm not willing to step on people to get, re you know, and that's the good thing I think about being an entrepreneur is that you have the ability to design your business the way you want around the core values that are important to you. So I think that's such an awesome thing that you just said, like, you're like, that's just what we do. Right. I love it. I love mm. it. I love it. All right. So um, let me get here really quick. So was there a, I always like to ask this question because I, you know, for me personally, as a child, I've, I've always been kind of a creative person. But interestingly enough, as I told you before the show, I went into accounting and there's nothing wrong with it. My mom did it, had a bookkeeping firm with it, but it wasn't my, where I ended up going down the road. I changed, ended up changing careers and doing something totally different. And I was telling this story one time about how I, when I was a kid, I would basically create businesses. Like I enjoyed coming up with ideas on how are we going to make money? You know, my friends were not always on that same mm -hmm. path as me because they wanted to play Barbies and ride bikes and do all that. Well, interestingly enough, you know, you go to school and then you get out and then I did this network marketing thing, was in that for a really long time. And kind of my creative flow just sort of went away. Well, then when I got to get back into that space, it was like, oh my gosh, this door of stuff opened up. And all these things started coming back. And so I was had a guest on my show at one time and she said, you know, your strengths and talents, they always kind of find you. And so if you're creative, they kind of come back. So was there a time in your childhood where you were like, this is what I want to do? Or did you just kind of well, like a, a defining moment or no? I grew up in business. My parents had a business, ran it out of the house. My father was an insurance consultant. Uh, my mother, who had trained as a um, lab tech in California, used to run our blood tests for us as kids. Uh, worked with him, and they had uh, several uh, ladies in the office. And my first job at six years old was making wet Verifax copies. And then I graduated to filing uh, group health sign-up sheets, yeah. sign-up cards, alphabetically, once I wow. understood the alphabet. Yeah, wow. So I always was in business. Uh, when I was 12 years old, I was going out and doing adjusting with my uh, father after fires. We'd go out and do insurance adjustments. Wow. So I just grew up in business. I grew up around people owning a business. Most of my father's friends owned their own business. So being in business for yourself was just something that I thought was natural. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people think, well, I, I'm, it's too much trouble to work, have my own business and all those hats you have to wear and everything else. And yeah, at times it's a pain. And when we first started, you know, I worked 80 hours a week. Uh, but the freedom that goes with being your own boss uh, is worth all the trouble because, yeah, if I want to take the afternoon off, take the afternoon off. Sure, I got to make up for it some point in right, time. Right. But I have the freedom to do what I want to do, when I want to do it, how I want to do it. And I am the captain of the ship. I am the master of my own destiny. Uh, it's uh, I'll make it or not make it on my own. And uh, I don't mind that at all. I love that. And I love the fact that, yeah, you're taking ownership of that. I think that is so important because I think a lot of times people do get into business and they, they hit, I always call it these potholes and that's the, you know, these objections. I, again, I come from the same mindset of you. I have always been around entrepreneurs and I've watched my parents struggle and have success and struggle. And I don't know that I really understood it any other way. Like I didn't really understand. I mean, I did work jobs where I had to work for somebody else, but I've never really understood that that was a long-term thing for me, you right. know? And, and even like I told you, when I took the, I work zone, I'll tell our listeners go back to the Jeff Yates podcast. Cause when I took that, you know, he told me, you don't need to be sitting behind a desk. You need to be out doing what you're doing. And so I, I think, I, I think that's awesome. And I love that you talk about the fact that you just, you know, you were at a young age, saw these opportunities and just did it. It was part of, it's almost like being on a, on a ranch. You just, yeah. you know, you just, that's part of the lifestyle. You do it. Yeah, exactly. You know? It's just like, it's growing up on the farm. You become a farmer. Exactly. Well, I, I grew up in business, so I became a business. Yeah. Man. I love that. I love that. That's so awesome. All right. So this is a fun question. I like to ask this because obviously you have tackled a lot of things and you've gotten through them. And I, and I love that. I, I think you're, you know, you've, I would say people have grit. But then there are people that have grit, like they have <laughs> grit and they know how to get th through things. And so what would you say? Or let me let me ask this question first. Tell us when you are going after something. So specifically, maybe like we were talking about your book that's coming out. When you're going after something, 
What does that process look like for you, the mindset? And we kind of touched upon it because you said, I've been in business. And so that was just part of my life. But what does that mindset look like for, for you when you're going after something? Well, it's planning. It is execution. Uh, you know, I'm a CPA. So I lay things out. I I have an idea and I start filling it out and I start expanding it. I outline it. Then I will develop a, a policy of how to get there. I'll develop all the plans and then just... Just, execute them once they're all set it. up. Yeah. Just go after it, it. It may take me longer than somebody who just says, well, I'm going to go do it. Right, uh, right. But it has more than once kept me from going over a cliff because I get into the plans and I realize, oh, this ain't going to work. That's not going to work. <laughs> I love it. Because I'm one of those sometimes that can kind of look at something and be like, let's go. We're diving in. Let's go. I'm, you know, I always tell you, I'm that person that like, if you need to rally your people and get them super excited, you need me there because I'm going right. to get them all fired up to go. But we always have to have the person there that can be that one that goes, let's reel it in. Let's lay the plans out. Because sometimes people will ask me, you know, I'll get this great idea. And they're like, so how are you going to execute that? And I'm like, I haven't figured that out yet, <laughs> but we're going to get it done. We're going to make it happen. Help. Where's my help? <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a planner. I'm, I'm not spontaneous. Yeah. It took me years to understand that. I just had to give my wife flowers upon occasion sometimes. Yeah. And to be spontaneous about it, I think she realized that I wasn't, but she appreciated it. Yeah, that's <laughs> awesome. No, that's good. Well, and yeah, and spontaneous is fun. And I know it's hard. You know, planning is, it's interesting because I used to be, I, I mean, I do plan things. And like I said, I do love my to-do list. And I talk about highlighters all the time because I love highlighters. Right. Love them. You know, but it's funny because... How, I, how many colors of highlighters do you have? Right. Well, I probably got about five right now. Okay. I, I need some new ones. I don't have that many. I love those and Sharpies. <laughs> Sharpies and highlighters. I always tell people, just give me Sharpies and highlighters. We're good. Um, but yeah, but I mean, I, I do like to plan and I feel be much more organized when yes. I have... That's why I love my to-do list because it really keeps me focused on what I need to get done. But I do, I get very bored and a lot of times I'm like, I need that spontaneity. I need a little bit of that in my life, just a little bit. So... <clears throat> But I love that. All right. So this is my my tough question. This is my getting back to my grit here. What would you say has been the hardest thing you've ever had to go through? And that could be work related, whatever you want to share. Surviving the death of my wife and my oldest daughters. Oh, my goodness. That is a lot. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Uh, my wife passed away five years ago. Okay. She'd been disabled for about nine from strokes. Okay. And the last one here, March 16th of oh five years ago, uh, she Coded on the way to the hospital. Wow. And then uh, 28 years ago, I lost my eldest daughter to cancer. Wow. Wow. So if my daughter was hard, my wife was severely harder. Um, it took everything. If I didn't have the business uh, and the responsibility for it, I think I would have just laid down and died. Yeah. Yeah. So it gave you something else to to work, to focus on. Yes. Yeah, yeah Thank definitely. God. You know, and that's so interesting that you say that because I always talk about that is that, you know, when we're going through these crises, naturally we want to get enveloped in them, like just get in them. And sometimes having that outlet, just it's not that you're forgetting that or pushing that to the side. It's just giving you a little inspiration to keep moving forward in something, you know, in a different direction. I, I had to go in in the morning and things needed to be done. And so it, it, it got me through the day and the week and the month and the year and then my life started to come back. Yeah. Wow. Into life. Wow. Wow. That is, yeah, you, you are a definitely strong person. And that's what I'm saying. I'm looking at your accolades and I'm just like, it's it, yeah. Incredible. And to have this, I mean, yeah, the, the guy that we had on this past week, Ben Jones, he talked a little bit about his dad had passed away four years ago. Such a remarkable story. And you're another example of taking a tragedy and turning that around right. and, and really pulling forward. And I talked about that with him is that he took that tragedy and really flipped it around being so young. It could have been so easy for him to just fall into this trap of victimhood, but he took, turned that around and really brought his first franchise at 25 years old. And you know, I, I, I talk about him all the time. I'm like, by the time he's in his forties, he's going to be doing really well. Well, Ruth and I had been married for 45 years when she passed. And now I have my newest book coming out. That's so awesome. So, you know, I've, I've, I miss her every day. Yeah. Don't misunderstand that. Right. I, right. I would do anything to have her back. Yeah. But you've got, You've got to continue to move on. So I agree with you. I agree with until you. Until I see you again. You're you're an awesome. You're awesome. I love it. I love it. All right. So we'll switch gears on you. Okay. Get out a little happier. Please. Now. We'll get gears. <laughs> what do you love most about what you get to do? I enjoy bringing 
my people uh, knowledge and experience and uh, teaching them and, and, and opening horizons for them. That is so fascinating to watch these people blossom. Uh, I'm, I'm a great believer in training and education uh, and growth. And sure, some of them are going to leave me. I understand that. And they move on uh, to something that I've helped them get ready for. Sure. Uh, and some stay with me. Uh, my right-hand person's been with me over 20 years. Wow. So, you know, uh, I don't have spots for everybody as they grow, so right. I help them move on, right. you know. Um, but that's that's the best thing about business is watching my, my people grow and succeed. Yeah, I love this. So how many, uh, roughly how many employees do you have working for you right now? About 20. 20? This is awesome. Yeah. And I've heard, I've heard really good things about you. So I think that's awesome. And I, I think it's such important, you know, creating culture in an environment because people, you know, especially with women, I talk about this all the time. Women don't stay in cultures for money. You know, they, they, they stay in there be, or excuse me, they don't stay in businesses for money. They stay in businesses because of culture. Yes. And I think that is so important when you're creating, you know, because it starts from the top and works down. So whatever Absolutely. the leadership is creating, that's what's happening on the bottom end. And so a lot of times when people are looking at organizations and they're wondering why their organizations are not running properly, I'm like you got to look up at the top, what's going on up there, because whatever their message they're sending you know, subliminal or, subliminal or not, whatever they're laying out is what people are perceiving and that's how they're behaving. I can tell in five minutes whether a manufacturing plant is well run or not. Wow. You walk up to the door, is there a parking spot for the executives? Yeah. And the people who work there have to trudge through the snow and go past these empty spots when they go to work. Mm. Is there a separate dining room for the executives? and walk into the men's restroom, and is it clean or is it a mess? Yeah. Because if they care about where they work, it'll be clean. Right. If they don't care, it'll be trashed. Yeah. Those three things will tell me literally in two minutes whether that plant is well run or not. Yeah, so expand, because I know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Expand for our listeners when you say like the, the executive spots and all that, kind of tell us what you're thinking on that. Well, because uh, I know, I kind of get, I, I know where you're going, I think. I, I, had a, I worked for an operation in North Carolina and they had executive spots right at the door. And I would park out in the employee parking lot. I would not use one. Right. I refused to. And I would trudge through the snow. Yeah. Okay. And when the day was done and on the weekend, my white Bronco with Texas plates in North Carolina would be sitting out in the employee parking lot by itself. And everybody that drove by in that small town knew whose it was. They knew where it belonged. <laughs> I love it. And that... Uh, so when I got the chance, those spots were erased. They gotcha. were for whoever got there first. We had an employee of the month and he had a spot. Okay. Okay. But the executives, they parked whatever the closest spot they could find. Yeah. And since they didn't get there for the start of the first shift, it was normally out in the far lot. But that's the way it should be. Yeah. If you don't treat your people right, uh, if you give yourself privileges that they don't have, it ain't going to work. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. I love that. That's and I, awesome. I love to go into the cafeteria and sit down, and people are always welcome to sit down and talk to me. When I'm in D.C. at the IRS, I've sat down with the commissioner more than once in the employee cafeteria when he has lunch. He yeah. always gets a salad. Wow. So, and other people sit down with him. I'm not the only one. Yeah. You know, I'm right. just up there five times a year. But he sits there in the cafeteria and talks to his people. So yeah. that And that's... He's he's well liked. I need mean, he's new. He's only been there a little over a year, and uh, he was an outsider for thirty eight years as a tax attorney. Wow! But they're really taken to him. Yeah. Well, and it's making me think about you know like the difference between mm. being a manager and a leader. Yes. Is what's coming to mind right now because managers manage their people, leaders get in the trenches with their people is the way I, I perceive things, and so, <laughs> and it's some it's kind of the thing that I had always tried to build with my organizations because when you start managing people. That's when you don't get them to do what you want them to do. <laughs> that that goes back to the Marine Corps training I had. Uh, the lieutenant that runs your platoon or your company, uh, when the mess when they come out with the, the mess truck, he's the last guy in line. Gotcha. He's not the first guy. He's he's taught. Yeah. He's the last guy. Wow. And if there's not enough food, he doesn't eat. That's part of leadership. Right. Okay. Love and it. I learned that as a non commissioned officer, you know, you got to take care of your people first. Right. If you take care of them. 
they'll take care of you. Exactly. You don't take care of them. You're in deep trouble. You got a mess, right? You got a mess. No, and that's it's so true in organizations because when you you look at it, see the way you say that about companies, I say that about people. When I meet them, I can figure them out pretty quickly by listening. I can do a lot of stuff by listening to people's what they say. Absolutely. But that is so true. It is, you know, in organizations, people they don't understand all that that you know, they're creating that culture in there and they wonder why their people are just a hot mess, you yes. know? And I, and I look at it, I sometimes I hear people talking about things in corporate. I'm like, I'm just thankful I'm not in there. <laughs> Cause I'm like, these people would all be fired. Like I'd be done with this. It'd be a whole new organization yes. by the time I'm done. Yes, you yes. Know? Yeah, I, I do not have a high opinion of most American corporate yeah, management. Yeah, well, this is why you're doing well because you got you've probably got it figured out, right? I well, love it. I keep practicing. So. That, well, and that's what that I think that's what it is, though. I think it's you know, it, a lot of that goes back to even personal development. I think it's an, an ongoing thing that you continue to do and do, and that's what I always say to people. It's like reading. I mean, the day you start reading, it's like you put yourself in a box and put a lid on it, you know, like, or, I mean, it's, it's growing. I, I was 65 when I got my U.S. tax court practitioner's uh, license. Wow. So it was things, the, the IRS was getting more difficult to work with. So I figured I needed the extra credentials yeah. and capability to take care of my clients. Yeah. And so I went and got that. But, uh, you know, I'm, this is my third year on the IRS advisory council go up to DC five times a year and work with the IRS directly. Wow. I'm learning constantly. Yeah. You, you have to, the world changes. Oh yeah. I mean, look, when I started out in accounting, it was still ledger paper. Okay. I haven't used a columnar pad in probably 20 years. Right. But you know, I used to have 15 different varieties. I know what them. you're talking about too. I know what those call, I know what those pads look like. I know what you're talking about. They're, they're, they're non-existent. I know. I, I don't even know what that, what accounting would be like now. Cause that's how I remember doing it was the, the pay, the little paper things. Yeah. It's so funny. Yeah. I've been out of that, but you know, I was thinking about you, like when you were talking about your jobs, cause like I started working, I remember being in elementary school and mowing yards and, and working my mom had, and you'll remember this. Remember they had executive suites back oh, yeah. in the eighties. Okay. So my mom owned several of those. And she had, her company was Ledger Bookkeeping and Service. So she had a bookkeeping service and then she'd answer phones for people and type for them. Because back then we typed on typewriters. Remember that? I remember all so, the typewriters. Yeah, so you remember all this stuff, the new the new apples that came out. Like I remember all these as a kid because my mom had the Xerox machine. I remember the first Xerox machine the office got. It's about the size of a washing yes, machine. Yes, yes. Sits on a desk, reduces the copy by 6%. Mm -hmm. But as opposed to doing the wet Verifax ones, God, it was. It right. Was, we were, talking, we were talking about when I was in college, I had one of those mm -hmm. little Xerox typewriter things. And back then you didn't, you didn't really have a computer. So we didn't have, we weren't able to just edit. So I would have to actually print out my reports for college, find the edits, go back into the little screen, correct them again, and then print it out. Like it was awful. <laughs> I'm like, how did we get through papers? I, I, I was a yeah. little before you because right, I used to write right. them out longhand yes. and then type them. Yes, I know. I know. <laughs> but it just cracks me up because I'm thinking about like our kid, my kids now, like everything's on the computer. And I'm like, I'm like, guys, we used to have the little type sheets on the typer. We put the whiteout thing, you put the paper in, back, you know, back it up to print it. Like oh, the, the erasing selectric was a huge that's so funny. advance. Yeah, that's so funny. I love it. I love it. All right. So fun question. Who would you say is your biggest influencer? My biggest influencer? It can be, it can be several if you've got more. Well, obviously my father comes to mind, you know, he, he taught me business and, and he taught me a lot of things. Uh, that's probably the, that and, and my wife, um, because my wife, uh, civilized me yeah. after, after the Marine Corps. <laughs> sure, sure. And, and taught me, well, she was 10 years older. She married her toy boy and raised him. I love it. So, toy boy. That's cute. <laughs> well, that's cute. Yeah. I was a 21-year-old Marine. Yeah, right. Buff. You know, the whole, yeah. I was, right. I promise you. <laughs> but you still work out. You were telling me you still work out. I love it. I love it. So uh, she, she probably is was more influence on my life than any single person that's awesome and we loved each other and it was it was a good marriage i love that i love that so awesome all right fun let's see here um this is a fun question i like to ask if you could be any superhero or character what would you pick you know i thought about that one because i'd seen that yes and i decided that i would probably pick the incredible hulk that's good i remember incredible hulk because 
Bruce Banner uh-huh. is the nice, mild mannered person. Gets along with everybody. He's he's nice to be with. He is compassionate. He's he's a nice guy. But when it comes to the IRS, you can't be a nice guy. So I could Hulk out. Yeah. And just beat the holy living bejabers out of him. I think that would be the perfect combination. I can so totally see this because you are, you're like totally a nice guy, but when you need to be serious, you'd like put it on, right? Yeah, I, I do. I love it. I take that, on my Marine Corps persona. That is so great. So I have a judge friend. I'm not gonna, I am not won't say too much on here, but she's got that same, you remind me of her because the same thing, like she can totally be like fun, but then when she needs to be a judge, like she's got her judge on. Yep. I'm like, it's like, there's no, like, like, you know, like me, like, I'm just, I'm all, I'm like this all the time. I'm like, I always tell me when you give me good or bad, like I'm either very passionate, excited or very passionate, mad either way. But it's like all, you know, I can't do the whole total turn off thing, but that's incredible. I love it. It's a good skill to have Yes. when you need it, especially with working with IRS. I mean, you would definitely need to be like well, on your game. A lot of times and, and there's a lot of good people and you can be nice and friendly. Uh, my, my staff just gets gaga when I start talking about grandchildren with an IRS agent. Oh my goodness. <clears throat> and all the things that go with it. Yeah. And I normally get what I want. Yeah. But sometimes they're either obstreperous or they don't know the law or they've made a mistake and you got to get hard nosed. Yeah. And you got to say, no, uh, uh, that's wrong. Uh, you have your supervisor call me. And then you tell the supervisor, well, I'm filing an appeals or I'm filing a tax court petition. And I know how now to take it upstairs and get to the right person. Uh, the new head of OPR, Office of Professional Responsibility, is a friend of mine. Yeah. So, you know, there's lots of things that you can get by, you can get with honey. But sometimes you got to pull the club out. Yeah. And, and just beat them up. I and agree. That's that's the IRS. Yeah, my, yeah. I well, that exactly, exactly. So, um, really quick, I want you to tell us because I didn't bring this up earlier. But so, tell us a little bit about your company. I want to tell why. How is this company unique? I want to know a little bit so so our listeners can get this from you. Okay, doing payroll and producing a check is not incredibly difficult. It's complex and there's a lot of moving parts. But the real problem in the payroll industry is compliance. The IRS issues $6 billion of employment tax penalties every year. Half of them get abated by people like me who know what they're doing. Okay? Uh, That's why I got my U.S. tax court practitioner. That's why I'm a CPA. I have the knowledge and the experience and the training to be able to do these things. The IRS makes millions of egregious mistakes every year. They make mistakes. And if you don't know how to attack those mistakes and show them and get it fixed, you just have to pay it and pay the interest and penalties. Gotcha. My clients don't pay penalties and interest. We had one that we solved last year. It had been hanging for nine years. Wow. It was $95,000 penalty with the interest in the penalties. We got it zeroed out. They ended up getting a $300 refund. Wow. Wow. But that took me going really to the deputy commissioner in that area, finally, and getting it looked at. And that was something I knew how to do. Most payroll companies don't have the the people, don't have the knowledge, don't have the professionals. They have clerks. Uh, And that's fine until you have a problem. You know, you buy car insurance, you buy auto, you buy homeowners insurance, right? right? In case something happens. Right. Well, we're payroll insurance. Gotcha. Okay. When something happens, we fix it. Love it. We have that capability. There's only about 200 U.S. tax court practitioners in the country. And I don't know of any others that work for payroll companies. So we can do things our competitors just can't do. If you've got a problem, you talk to a CPA. If the CPA can't solve it, the tax court practitioner may be able to. So, you know, we've never lost a tax court case. Wow. So our clients just don't pay the penalties that other payroll companies' clients do because we fight them and we fight them and we fight we know, them. We know who we're going to call if we need we need help with our taxes, right? We're yes. calling you. I love it. Yes. I'm so glad we met. I'm glad Anash <laughs> connected us. Well, I have to tell them, that's so awesome. So real quick, I know, so you've written three books. You got another one coming out now. And I know you don't want to sneak and tell us too much about that one, but tell us a little bit, maybe. Tell us a little bit about these books, how they, how they come about and uh, well, give us some the, details on them. Well, there was my experience and my knowledge. And, you know, I started writing books and the last one on the, the, 
the salon was my marketing manager had been an esthetician, so she knew the industry. So we wrote a book for the back office of that. And that was the impetus for our newest one, which is literally the payroll book. And it's a complete guide for small business and startups. Love it. And it basically takes, if you don't know anything about payroll, uh, when you get done with a book, you'll know how to do most everything. It's just designed for small businesses, which are 95% of the businesses in the country. I mean, it's not a book for IBM or General sure. Motors or TI, sure. but it's a book for the local mechanic, uh, the guy that opens the, the cafe, the small restaurant, the doctor, the dentist. You know, if they want to do it or understand it, that's great. And once they understand it, they'll probably think, man, yeah, it's cheaper to have Charles do it. <laughs> I was going to say, that's where that delegation comes in, right? They'll be like, oh, I read that book. Okay, never mind. But it's a good yeah. plug for you. They know where to come back and find you now, right? Well, that's that's the whole purpose exactly. of the book. Exactly. Exactly. I love it. I love it. That's great. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Well, this has been super fun. I've had, I could talk to you for a little longer. We could just keep going here, right? So if our listeners wanted to find you, where do they come get you at, Charles? It's www.getpayroll.com. Dot com, or they can, frankly, they can pick up the phone and call me 972-353-0000. Awesome. And I'll be sure when this goes out next week, I will put the information in there so they have it all in the post. That way they can see Thank it on you. there and check you out and all that good stuff. This has we're, been incredible. We're, we're looking for uh, clients all the time and yeah. we like to help people and solve their problems and give them what they're looking for. Awesome. Anything else you want to add and tell us before we wrap up here? No, I'm, it's been fun. Do I've you, enjoyed it. I do have a question for you. What what else you got coming up besides this book coming out? Any more appearances anywhere? Anything else happening that we need to know about? Well, the, the appearances are pretty much on the hold at the yes, moment. right, right. But yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to do. I'm doing a lot of public speaking. I've been uh, doing all the Rotary Clubs in the area. Okay. I'm a Rotarian. I'm a long-term Rotarian. Uh, so we do a lot of that. And we're looking for more speaking engagements uh, with the book. Uh, as I said, coming out in July. Awesome. Uh, and awesome. the the the, uh, the payroll book and the payrollbook dot com is the website for it. Okay. And there'll be a pre order form on there for anybody that's interested. Great. I'm glad you mentioned that because I was going to ask you about that. So glad you mentioned that. So awesome. Okay. Well. I do want to say to our listeners, if you love our podcast, please be sure you give us a rating on iTunes and Facebook, because of course we can't do this without you. And we do want to say thank you to Charles Reed. You are amazing. I love your story. You've just got so many great things there and you're doing some awesome things. It's impressive. So with that, we want to wrap up with our mantra here. It's a great day to be brave. You might as well start now. You have the power to change your circumstances any day you decide. Let today be that day. Rise up, be amazing, be you, do you. All right, you guys take care, be safe, and be kind to one another. And thank you, Charles Reed, for being our guest. Jennifer, my pleasure. Thank you. You guys take care.